The following presentation was produced by the Buddhist Society of Victoria. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. So do you love life? Every part of life? No, that's discriminating. Sometimes we love the nice part of life. And the other part of life where people suffer, we don't like at all. But if you really love life, you have to love the whole lot. Even when you are sick. Is there anyone in this room who's never been sick? So you've all been sick, so sickness is normal. It's usual. In fact, it would be very weird if you weren't sick from time to time. You'd be a weird case and the universities in Melbourne would get you into their labs, do experiments on you and find out why you don't get sick. There'd be something very wrong with you if you don't get sick. That's why sickness is usual, normal. Whenever I, uh, any of my students, they go and see the doctor. The doctor knows it's a student of Ajahn Brahm because they say to the doctor, Doctor, there's something right with me. I'm sick again. <laughs> That's not just a joke because that is stopping stigmatizing sickness. Stopping denial about sickness. Accepting sickness as part of life and in fact loving sickness. Can you love sickness? Sometimes it gives you a week off if you're not a monk. <laughs> you can get some sick leave. But at least it teaches us about our body. It teaches us about other people's bodies. It teaches us to be kind and caring to people. Because people give me so many more things when I'm sick. They're much kinder to me when I'm sick. Which means that sometimes I don't really want to get better. I'd lose all your sympathy. But if we keep a good attitude towards all types of life, we can always learn no matter what life throws at us. And we can enjoy it. So, there's one of my favorite similes, which surprisingly I haven't mentioned during this trip. But I'm sure that many of you remember about the person who came to Box Hill Town Hall, listened to a wonderful talk, and then afterwards when they were walking home inspired, they trod in the dog poo. And it went all over their shoes. What do you do when you tread in dog poo and it goes over your shoes? My advice is, don't scrape it off, but take it home with you. <laughs> take it home with you and only scrape it off when you're, uh, you're next to your apple tree. Scrape it off under the apple tree and then Okay, is that a complaint already? <laughs> Scrape it off. Yeah, please turn off your mobile phones, because if you don't turn off your mobile phones, if it's during the middle of a very important simile or talk, your phone creates bad karma. <laughs> and I said yesterday that one of the things which happens to, to, to technology, especially for phones which, which, <coughs> which go off during a talk, it's such bad karma that in its next incarnation, your smartphone will be reincarnated as a parking meter, but actually there's something worse than that. <laughs> a speed camera. <laughs> Two of the lowest forms of technology. <laughs> Causing a lot of pain to people. And why is that the case? Because your phone made bad karma, you didn't turn it off. But anyway, going back to treading in the dog poo. And if you tread in the dog poo, take it home and, and, and um, dig it in under your, your apple tree and wait. And one year later, maybe two years later, your apples 
will be so sweet and so juicy that when you bite into that apple fertilized by the dog shit, mm, and all of that juice runs down your cheek, sweetest, delicious apples you've ever got, and you must always remember what you are really eating. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? What you're really eating is dog poo. Transformed into delicious, juicy apple. And that's the same with any sickness in life. Sometimes we can deny it, as I tell, well, I want to get rid of it. But if we're wise, we turn everything into fertilizer for our heart, for our compassion, for our wisdom. Nothing cannot be used. So, this is why when we love life, it's not just the nice part of life. I don't know that Melbourne is a very sport-loving city, so I'm told. But I learned about sport when I was a young man. I always say I was brought up in the bush, shepherd's bush, in London. And my father first took me to a soccer team. The soccer team he took me to was a team called Fulham. They kept on losing. They kept on getting relegated. They kept on, so that was my first lesson in suffering. <laughs> Always losing. So much so that I decided, oh, supporting a soccer team is so much suffering. And I thank that I supported a bad soccer team because that meant I could leave the world, become a monk. It had a benefit. So I don't know how anyone, does anyone support Collingwood? I think if you support Collingwood for too long, you should become a monk too. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so you love life and you don't always think that winning and succeeding needs to be fulfilling in your life. Because sometimes when things go wrong, that is some of the most beautiful fertilizer for your life. When you make mistakes, when your relationship goes pear-shaped. So I know a lot of times people ask me, so, oh, Ajahn Brown, please help relationships, counseling. They said, me? I've been a monk for 45 years. What do I know about relationships? But still they ask me. Maybe it's because I live outside the box. Maybe because I'm distant from relationships, you can see them a bit more clearly. And so this was two Thai ladies who came to me for counseling some years ago. And the elder sister, she had a husband and had a very difficult relationship. So much so, she was really considering separation. And I said, no, no, just give it a try and give all sorts of, you know, you can't expect your husband to be perfect. Has anyone here got a perfect husband? Be honest, they don't exist. <laughs> if you go to like a husband swap shop, <laughs> you get a different one, they're the same. They may look different, but you know, the engine's the same. So I want a newer model. No, it's still you know, the same thing. But anyway, she was thinking of getting a new husband. And I just counseled her and just gave her some advice and just know how to live together with another person. You know, little things like the story of um, the lady with her husband finished a mining contract in Australia. She was Canadian and instead of flying back to Canada, they were young, they didn't have any kids yet. They had this wonderful idea of like she selling their little house, buying a little yacht, not a fancy yacht, and teaming up with another couple, sailing it all the way to Vancouver, where they would sell their yacht and they'd have the money to buy their next house. It wasn't financially, it was a very good, good idea, but also it was a lovely trip of a lifetime 
two young couples sailing through the, the Southern Pacific Ocean, visiting all these different islands, slowly making their way back home, no rush to Vancouver. But she arrived safely. But when she arrived back in Vancouver, and now she's in Toronto, she wrote me a letter telling me of one of these amazing incidents which happened during the voyage. The engine broke down and she and her friend's wife didn't know how to fix engines. So they were on the deck of the boat while the two men were in the engine room trying to fix up this engine. Now remember, even if you are a member of the RAC, they can't actually call them out into the middle of the Pacific Ocean. You cannot get roadside assistance. You cannot get anything out there. You're on your own in the middle of the ocean. And so they were in the engine room trying to fix up an engine and nothing seemed to go right. They couldn't sort of, uh, with the wrenches, they couldn't sort of move the nuts. And sometimes the little nuts would fall down into the most uh, deepest recesses of the engine. It was cramped, it was hot, it was frustrating. You know what happens when it gets frustrating? You start blaming others. Your fault. You should have done this. You should have done. They had an argument. And the argument got worse and worse and worse until they were shouting at one another. And one of the men got so crazy with anger, he threw down his wrench. He said, right, that's it. I'm leaving. <laughs> he actually did this, believe it or not. He threw down his wrench, went back to his cabin, washed his hands, changed into nice clothes and packed his bags, all the time being just crazy with rage. And when he appeared on deck with his nice clothes on, with his two bags packed, the wives looked at him, where do you think you're going? There's ocean all around, as far as the eye can see. We're in the middle of the ocean. And he realized something. There was no place to run. Embarrassed, he turned around, went back to his cabin, changed into his work clothes, and went back into the engine room to help. He had no choice. And I thought that's a wonderful little simile that sometimes in life, because we have a choice to run away, you know, from our relationship, we don't work it out, that sometimes we take that easy option. But if you imagine yourself in a boat, there's no place to go. It's amazing just how you can work things out in a relationship. How you find you do focus on the negative way too often, instead of focusing on the nice part. Water the flowers in your partner, not the weeds. And anyway, that they managed to fix up that engine and sail back. But this Thai lady, I think she managed to keep their relationship going with her husband, but at the time, it was very, very dodgy. And then I talked to her sister. And her sister, she was a woman who, you know, she was young, attractive, but she could never find a partner. She went out with a guy, a nice guy, for a week, two weeks, maybe a month at the max, and it all fell apart. And she said, why is it I can't find a husband? I want a husband, and then I don't know what's wrong. Give me some advice. And being a monk, I saw the solution straight away. I said, listen, your sisters, your sister has a husband she doesn't want. <laughs> and your, your sisters, you're, you're looking for one, share. <laughs> and what's wrong with that? They wouldn't buy it. <laughs> and then I got serious. I said, you're married, woman. The elder sister, you've got what we called married person's suffering. That's what it's like. But you also have married person's happiness as well. Don't just focus on the suffering. You have lots of joy and happiness as well. <coughs> and you, the single sister, you have got what we call single woman suffering. 
Now, you, the single woman, if you get married, you won't have single woman suffering anymore. You'll have married woman suffering. <laughs> Same suffering, only a different flavor. <laughs> so they thought, well, what can we do? Can we become nuns? They were Thai Buddhists. Can we become Buddhist nuns? Well, if you become a Buddhist nun, you don't have married woman suffering. You don't have single woman suffering. You have Buddhist nun suffering. <laughs> so why is it in life we change one form of suffering to another form of suffering? We don't really escape from it because we don't really understand the nature of contentment and learning how to be with things rather than blaming things. So it's the same when I was, you know, when I was a young monk. When I was a young monk, I was fit, skinny, handsome, <laughs> and I had to work really hard. And when we had any meditation, I didn't get a cushion to sit on. I was sitting on the hard concrete. And all those senior monks, they had the big cushions. And I looked at them, they didn't need a cushion. They were already fat. They had natural upholstery. <laughs> and they also got the best food. And me, a young monk, just you no know, really hungry, I just got what was left over. And I thought that was really unfair. Those senior monks like Ajahn Chah, they're probably already in line. They didn't need that, that really delicious food. They should give it to me because I had lots of defilements. <laughs> and I had to work really hard. I was a young monk, and I realized I had young monk suffering. Now I'm an old monk. I'm fat, I don't need cushions, but I get lots of them. I don't need delicious food, but people want to give me delicious food. And I look at those young monks, those young monks who can sit on the chairs and don't have to give talks. <laughs> they don't have to go traveling all over the place getting tired. They don't have to have bars quit. They don't have to have their photograph taken. Be careful of taking photographs. Because I noticed that in Indonesia, where I go often, that Bod Pudor, you know, the great Buddhist monument in the middle of Java, in, uh, in, uh, in Yogyakarta, that big Buddhist monument, they have tried to ban people from taking flash photographs. And the reason is because the flash actually degrades the stone. So every time you take a photograph, you're degrading my face. <laughs> <coughs> it's getting worse and worse. But anyway, so anyway, that sometimes when it comes to enjoying life, don't think that if you get the right partner or you get rid of a partner, then you'll be happy. Don't think that if you get the best job, then you'll be happy. Don't think that if you win the lottery, you become rich, then you'll be happy. The only way you can love life is loving life now, as it is. Being sick, being poor, being fat. Actually, I never explain to people, this is not fat. Really, it's not fat. Every year I practice as a monk, I grow in compassion. I get kinder every year. Every year my heart gets bigger. <laughs> Many years ago my heart grew so big it actually pushed against my rib cage. And now it had nowhere else to go as it grew bigger and bigger, but down and out. <laughs> this is not fat, it's a big heart. That's my excuse and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> but anyway, when you're at peace and happy with yourself, when you love life, it's much easier to love all of life, the sickness and also just the death. You know, recent, recently, I get to do some really interesting um, uh, talks sometimes. And I was invited by my uh, friends, disciples in, South Korea recently 
to go to um, the demilitarized zone between the two Koreas to give a talk and a meditation on peace. And when I went there, I never realized they also wanted not just to do some meditation, but to do a peace walk inside the demilitarized zone. And there was another couple of senior monks there, including Ajahn Gunho, some of you know, and he was too ill to do the walk, so I volunteered. A three hour walk, it was, what was it, 12 or 15 kilometers inside the DMZ. They call it DMZ over there. And you know, I was leading 6,000 Korean Buddhists inside the demilitarized zone. That's really scary. And you know, honestly, there was a lot of shooting. I was shot many times. Click, click, <laughs> click. <coughs> With a camera. But it was a wonderful experience to be able to do something which was going to be helpful and useful. You know, it was, it was on the TV, but it's wonderful to be able to do things like that. So whatever you do in life, you learn how to enjoy it, make the most of it. Are you a monk? Be a happy monk. Not only does that accord with the Buddha's teachings, I never actually said about being fat, having a big heart, sorry, that's what I meant. You know that one of the people I admired when I was a young boy, one of the people I thought, if ever I join a religion, this is the sort of person I would like to be. You know you have your, your, your icons you'd like to live up to. And that icon was always one of the most generous religious people I'd ever seen. And he was always happy and smiling. And he was always fat. And even though he was old when I was young, he's still alive today. You can see them in shopping centers in Melbourne on just before in December. It's called Santa Claus. <laughs> Fat, jolly, and happy. So I thought, I don't want to be around miserable people. I want to have, see people who understand life and who love life. And also, even in some of the most difficult areas of life. Going to see people who are sick in the ICU. If you go, look, there was this one uh, Tibetan nun years ago. She was in the, the, um, the hospice. She was dying of some sort of cancer. And I was counseling her for a while and just being a good friend to her. And then one day I got a, a call from her and she said, I'm about to die. I think it's probably been the next couple of days. Can you come and visit me one last time? I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but people actually know when they're about to go. Even though the doctors did say that she's going to go the next day, she knew she had about 24 hours. So I stopped whatever I was doing, and I got a car, and I went to this hospice. It's about an hour and a half from the monastery where I live. And getting to that hospice, I had to check in with the nurse, first of all. You can't just waltz into a room of people really, really sick. And so the duty nurse said, I am sorry, sir, but she has given specific instructions, no visitors. And I said, but she called me about an hour and a half ago. I don't care about that. We have to follow and respect our patient's instructions. But I've come all this way. Right, she said, come over here. She was really angry at me. And she took me to this patient's room and there was a big notice on there. Absolutely no visitors. And she saw that notice and she pointed it out to me and said, see? Ugh. Well, she didn't say uh, but I just made that up. <laughs> and 
I looked at it and it actually said absolutely no visitors. But there was small print at the bottom, except for Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> and I couldn't resist looking at that really uh, fierce nurse, looking her in the eyes and saying to her, see? <laughs> I wasn't very Buddhist or compassionate, but I did enjoy it. <laughs> and so I went into that room and I asked, first thing I asked is, why did you write that? Why sort of um, uh, did you write that message, no visitors except me? He said, because, you know, I'm, I'm dying. I know I'm dying. And people come into this room and they get so sad. They get so emotional. It's hard enough dealing with my own death and dealing with other people's emotional trauma, and that's just too much. But you, Ajahn Brahm, you just come in here and tell me jokes. You treat me as a human being, not as someone who's dying. And I thought that was wonderful to see beyond the disease, beyond the death process, treat her as a human with kindness, with love. I was loving the dying process. It's not going to, to solve it by hating the dying process, rejecting it, being in denial about it, but at least uplifting her. She knew what was going to happen. She had all the teachings. She just needed an uplift of good energy. And to this day, you, know, you realize that some people, because they don't love life, they're afraid of death, they don't love the whole of life, they don't know how to deal with disappointments and suffering, that sometimes they make matters so much worse. Just like one of my mates, my friends, when he was a monk, he got really, really, really sick. He had two types of typhoid fever at the same time. I don't know how he managed that to get two strains, but it really got him so close to death. He survived, but he never really got better. He's always really sick. It really knocked his immune system and his body apart. Eventually they found out it was, he developed Crohn's disease as a result of that. And he was a Rhodes Scholar, he was a champion wrestler from Oxford. He's, you know, he's from Tennessee there. And he was such a lovely fellow, but he got so sick. And then we sent him to our monastery in England, thinking that somehow or other he'd get better treatment there. But he was one of these people who never got better and he was up in the attic room of this monastery in Chithurst for about two or three years. Every time he got a bit of energy, he made it to the, the door and then just had no energy and dragged himself back into bed. And I went to visit him once and just you know, spent a little time with him. But it was so sad, just this really strong Rhodes Scholar, champion wrestler was just no, just waiting to die. And that was when one of the monks in that monastery went out to his room and said his amazing words. He said, I've come up here on behalf of all the monks who've ever known you, and the nuns too, in behalf of all our supporters and friends, and everybody who loves you and cares for you. I've come up here on behalf of all of those to give you permission to die. Stop trying to get better. Stop thinking you're letting people down by not getting better. Relax. And of course, this very tough Tennessean wrestler burst out into tears and wept and wept and wept. And that was the time he started to get better. That was about 20 years ago. He's still alive today. Do you understand the psychology of that? When we're afraid of sickness, when we're afraid of death, we don't know how to love life and accept life and be with life. Then we make it worse. If any of you uh, have loved ones, people you really care about, if you really love them, and they're in the deathbed, then please, like what happened to this American, Steve, and his wife, Jenny. Jenny was an Australian nurse. Steve was a white water rafter, fit as could be, but contracted cancer, about 27, 28 years of age. 
that people say too young to die, but that's our life, that's our universe. And so that he contracted cancer, and I was again you know, looking after him, counseling, visiting very regularly. And then he got so sick, so thin, emaciated, and I was wondering why he wasn't dying. And of course then the message became very clear. I told Jenny, his wife, have you given Steve permission to die yet? She never answered me, but she understood straight away. She jumped up on his bed. It's one of the most beautiful memories I have of you know, understanding what counseling is. To jump up on his bed, put her arms around the love of her life, so gently because it was skin and bones, looked in his eyes and said, Steve, it's okay, you can die. I give you permission. I love you enough to let you go. And that night he died. It was as if the worst thing you could possibly do to somebody else is to die on them. The worst answer you can give when you go and visit a loved one in hospital, how are you feeling today? I said, oh, a little bit better. And you know they're lying because they don't want to say that I'm feeling really rotten. I'm feeling terrible, I'm feeling much worse. Because if they say that, it's such a downer. You come all that way to visit them and this is what you tell them. Sometimes the pressure is on you to get better and that is stress. So please don't ask a person, are you feeling better today? Let them tell you if they feel better. Because otherwise they'll stretch the truth to please their visitor. So anyway, that when you give people permission just to be, to love their life and their death and the dying process, life gets much easier and more happiness. There's nothing wrong with dying. In fact, it's great that you ask Buddhist monks and nuns about dying process because in Buddhism, you know, we get reincarnated. So we've died many times. In other religions, they only die once. So we have all the experience. <laughs> That's only a joke, but it's a funny one. So when you learn how to love life, then it's easy to love death. And anyway, I don't know how many of you have been to funeral services, and I do many funerals for Buddhists. And I just point it out in a totally different way. Just like the story which I, when I, I do break, break traditions, years and years ago, I decided I was going to tell a joke at a funeral service. And funeral services are really somber. So somber that when the funeral director sitting in the back, or actually standing in the back, when they heard I was about to tell a joke, they went, no, no, no. <laughs> but I wasn't going to let them stop me. So I carried on with the joke. And the joke was about, if you don't know that story, it's about this elderly couple. They were both, you know, they'd been married for years together and one died, the other one died a couple of days later. It's as if you know, they were just so in tune with one another that when one died, the other one just, you know, just lost a lot of purpose to live. Mm -hmm. So they died as well. So they were, did the funeral ceremony together, buried together, and because of their good karma, they went to heaven together. When they got to heaven, that an angel came to them and said, Sir, because of your kindness and generosity, because of your good karma, I show you your heavenly abode, this beautiful mansion, you now overlooking the ocean, on the cliffs. It was what had these million, no, multi-million dollar views. And the man said, wow, that's too expensive for someone on my pay grade. I won't be able to afford the insurance. No, not the insurance, sorry, the rates. You know, the, the local government taxes you have to pay every year. 
you know, the council rates on such a big house. And the angel looked at them and said, can I say, is anyone from the Vauxhall Council here? <laughs> so we don't have councils up in heaven. They can't come up here. So it's all for free, your heavenly reward. And took them inside. When he took them inside, it was this beautiful mansion, so many rooms. And they had to look to the chandeliers. They weren't like a Waterford crystal. This was diamonds in the chandeliers. And they saw this big, big uh, full screen TV. It was you know, 100 foot wide. And he said, we always understood you like watching the AFL. And on this AFL, we made sure that Collingwood always wins. <laughs> it's heaven. And, and then he took them into the bathroom. In the bathroom, the, the toilet was made out of gold. And the little button you pressed to flush was another diamond. And when you flushed it, it wasn't water came out. Chanel number no. five came out. <laughs> Such an expensive house. Everything was antique. Everything was just so, so um, uh, expensive. The guy said, look, I'll never be able to uh, afford the insurance premium. This is such an ex a wealthy house. And the angel looked at him again, what are you talking about? Insurance. We don't allow thieves and robbers up into heaven. You can just enjoy it as much as you like. You don't have to pay any insurance. And then, took them to the garage. Not a double garage, a triple garage. And the first car they saw there was this huge stretch limousine. It was so big, had a swimming pool inside. <laughs> the next car was a, a four-wheel drive SUV, could go anywhere could go over rough terrain, over mountains, could even go up waterfalls. No, up them, not down them. And the next car was a special edition, um, not a Lamborghini, it was a Ducati. The most expensive car in the world. Let's call it a Lamborghini. A special edition Lamborghini with sunroof and special tires, souped up. and. He said, we, we've got this expensive sports car for you. Because you, we knew how much you liked sports cars. You looked at the magazines. You just, you know, real petrol head. But you could never afford one. And he said, well, look, what's the point of buying a sports car in Melbourne? There's traffic jams. You can never go fast anyway. And if you do go fast, what happens? You get zapped by the police. He said, sir. There's no police up in heaven. There's no speed cameras up in heaven. You can go as fast as you like. But isn't it dangerous? What are you talking about? You're already dead. <laughs> you can go as fast as you like. And then, as he opened, opened the doors of the garage doors on the opposite side of the road, was an immaculate 18 hole golf course and he said that golf course we know how much you enjoy playing golf that was designed by Tiger Woods himself because <laughs> you know that story just when he had this, this bust up with his wife many years ago and he was driving his car and had a crash many people don't know that at the time of the crash he had an out of the body experience went up to heaven designed the golf course and then he came back <laughs> I guess I'm making it up. When he said, this is a special golf course we designed for you. And because it's a heavenly golf course, whenever you, uh, your ball uh, gets to the green, whichever way you putt it, it will always curl into the hole. It's heaven. And he said, but look at that clubhouse. You have to have connections. And I have to pay a lot of money to join that golf club. And the angel rolled his eyes again. He said, what are you talking about? That you're already a member of that golf, golf club. And he said, what, a life member? He said, no, a death member. <laughs> and at that, the angel left them. And of course, as soon as the angel left them, this guy got angry at his wife. 
really scolding her, really upset at her. And she couldn't understand it. Why are you so upset at me? You've got this beautiful mansion. You've got this amazing TV set where you can watch Collingwood win every match. And you've got your red, red sports car. You can go as fast as you like in your golf course on the opposite side of the road. This is heaven. Why are you so upset at me? And that is when the husband looked at his wife and said, Darling, wife, wife, if you hadn't given me all that healthy food in the last years of my life, I could have been up here years ago. <laughs> That's why I'm angry at you. <laughs> so I told that joke at the funeral, the first joke I ever told at a funeral, and all of the family, thank you. That is what the deceased person would have wanted. They didn't want people to be upset at their life. They loved life and they wanted to carry on that love of life to the love of death and to be able to love so much to let a person go. And this is one of the reasons why that when I do go to funerals, I remember one of the very first funerals I went to which was my father's funeral. How to love life and let someone go and even to love the negative part of life, death. You've all experienced the loss. Uh, maybe I'll stop there. Not the loss, but the death of a loved one. Is it really a loss? Because when my father died, I never cried. I was only 16 years of age. I loved my dad very much. He was the one who taught me about the door of your heart is open no matter what happens. Unconditional love. And when he died, at the time he died at home, I also shook him to try and wake him up. You felt death, went to the funeral service, never cried, never cried since. How can that be? And I, as a monk, had the time to understand my emotions. And I realized the emotion I felt at somebody's death was exactly the same as the emotion I felt at the end of one of the great concerts I was privileged to experience in London. I was a young man growing up in London. And you heard some of the most wonderful bands, even when they were just starting. I know that you know the Venerable Chanda, who's helping build a nun's monastery, Bikuni Monastery in, in England. She was just shocked when I told her, because her favorite band was Led Zeppelin. And I went to their very, very first concert in the Marquee Club in Wardour Street in London. The very first concert of what turned out to be an amazing band. I saw many other great concerts in those days. And uh, one of the, the um, musical concerts I went to, it was only in the, the top room of a pub in North London. And I was really surprised because it was only a small band, not well known. And only six people turned up to watch them. But they played for us anyway. I know who the lead singer of that band was? Rod Stewart private concert with Rod. And so I had all this amazing, just and also classical music and jazz music, uh, seeing Robbie Coltrane and uh, uh, Miles Davis. I loved all types of music. This was really you know, the greatest musicians of that age. And then whenever I, whenever the, the concert started to end, the whole audience would stand up, clap and shout for more, the encore. And the band would always carry on for a little while. And after the encore had finished, I knew that the music had ended. Maybe that band would play again, but not like that. The music would always change. And even I knew the concert was over and I probably would never hear such a band play such music ever again. 
as I walked out of those pubs and concert halls and clubs of London into the cold, dark, wet, drizzly London night. Never once did I cry that the concert was over. Never once did I feel sad that I'd lost something. I just felt exhilarated, blessed, so fortunate to be able to experience some of the greatest music of that time. And that's exactly how I felt at my father's death. A great concert had come to an end. Yeah, I'd had many encores, came very close to dying several times. The doctors pulled him through. But the encores came to an end. He died. I never felt sad. I never felt it to be a loss. But again, thank you so much for being my father for 16 years. Of course, you'd have wanted 20, 30, 50 years. Sometimes I wonder, what do you think of me now? Being a monk and being shot out on the demilitarized zone. <laughs> going to concerts, going to actually being a, like a rock star, especially in Indonesia. I mean, it's two and a half thousand people sort of in the last talk I gave in Indonesia. Everyone wanting photographs and book signings. So it's just nothing here, just signing a few books. And that was only a few weeks ago. And so my father thinks this is crazy stuff. So sometimes I think just how proud he would be. But it doesn't matter. Those 16 years I cherish. I celebrate. I don't feel sad. He wasn't taken away. I had him for 16 years and that was such a blessing. So when someone close to you dies, don't think how sad they're gone. Look at it another way. You've had them for that amount of time, had a wonderful time together, a great concert you've been part of, and you'll never forget it. It's beautiful. So you look at the positive side, you are loving life and also loving death. And it's great to be able to do things differently, challenge stereotypes and do things in another way. Which is why I was very impressed with a gentleman in the United States who decided to celebrate his funeral service while he was still alive. He was going to die in a couple of weeks, so he organized his funeral before his death. Because you know when you go to other people's funerals, they say these wonderful things about you. They're called eulogies. And the problem is, you miss out on that. <laughs> You're dead when they say, how wonderful and kind and how loving you were and all the wonderful things why they would bless you with their father, their friend and you don't manage to experience that. So he decided he's going to die soon so to have his funeral before he died. It literally, well, you know, the, the, the coffin was there but it was empty. It was a great example of thinking outside the box. <laughs> <laughs> and he did that. And he heard all these amazing things of you know, how people really cared and loved him. It's a shame that people don't say that when they're still alive. You know, we never actually tell each other how much we appreciate and the wonderful qualities that, you know, we see in that person who's our, our father and our mother, our brother, our, our pet dog or whatever. We never actually say that, except at the funeral. But that is a bit late, so do the funeral early. He said the, the unexpected benefit also was he could actually see who actually turned up for his funeral <laughs> in time he could adjust his will. <laughs> so it's like actually looking at things a little bit differently. We can love life and if we love life, give a good attitude to life, it's also we tend to love death as well. Just keep it natural. And the last little story is uh, <laughs> there was, again, it was the father of our Buddhist uh, 
Society West Australia librarian. He was from Lancashire, called Ted. And Ted, you know, because at that age they would smoke. And they'd grown up with smoking and then passive smoke. He developed a cancer. He was on his last, last legs. So he was in the hospice. And I went to visit him. And he said the first day he was in the hospice, you know, just treating the a palliative care, he was going to die. The nurse came up to him and asked him, he said, um, what do you want for dinner, <laughs> Ted? And Ted said, well, you know, it's not just cancer I've got. I've got sort of, you know, hardened arteries. I can't have anything salty. I just have, um, I have diabetes, so I can't have anything sugary. You know, I, I can't have anything oily. And the nurse looked at him and said, Ted, what are you talking about? You know, the cholesterol's not going to kill you. The hardened arteries are not going to kill you. The diabetes is not going to kill you. The cancer's going to kill you well before that. You can eat whatever you like. And his eyes went wide. You mean I can have salty food, greasy food, sugary food? He said, yeah. Cancer's going to get you before that does. <laughs> so his eyes went wide open. And he had all this food his wife would never allow him to eat for years. The greasiest, saltiest, <coughs> sugary food. And this is no exaggeration. He enjoyed his food so much his cancer went into remission and he walked out of that hospital, had an extra six months of life before the cancer returned and he went back into the hospice to die properly. <laughs> and that was a true story. Why did that happen? Because the love of life, allowing things to be, embracing life in all its particular forms is a very healthy alternative. If you're afraid of death, you die quickly. If you love life and are willing to accept death, you extend life. The joy, the happiness, the joie de vivre and the joie de mort. I don't know if that is a French word but the love of everything, being at peace with things. When your time goes, you had a wonderful time. Thank you for your life. And thank you for listening. Okay, so any questions, comments or complaints? Good evening, Adrian Bram. Um, I have a question. How do we know if someone uh, gets enlightened and how can we attain enlightenment? How do you know if someone's enlightened? It's hard to know if somebody's enlightened, but it's very easy to know if they're not enlightened. <laughs> That's the answer. Hee hee hee. Hello there. Hello there. Um, I wanted to know how much does the I, the me, the my, have involved in controlling the process of life? Does it just happen or can we somehow stand in there, control it, manipulate it, or does it just happen almost like a pre-planned destiny? No, the I, me or mind is what messes up life. It's, it, because if it's me and I, we have what's called materialism, how much you own, your successes in life. We also have, which ties into the previous question, spiritual materialism. How enlightened are you? I'm, my teacher's more enlightened than your teacher. Nah, 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 nah. I've got more wisdom than you have. Now, I've been to more retreats than you have. My meditation... There's something terribly wrong with the spiritual materialism comparing 
people. The I is what has to be seen through and vanishes. The me, you know, who are you anyway? Who do you take yourself to be? And lastly, the mind. What do you own? I don't own my body. And you know when you let it go, when you're at peace with it, it tends to heal. But if you control it, you better fade of it, and it's personal responsibility, then you find that you worry too much. Because I have many duties, that I was so busy that sometimes when I went to my own monastery where I live, I could never enjoy it. People come and say, wow, such a peaceful, beautiful monastery where you live. And I told them, peaceful, beautiful, you must be crazy. There's so much work here. There's so much I have to do. I'm the abbot. I've got to teach all these monks and all these visitors. I've got to write books. I've got to organize talks. I've got to answer emails. I've got to make sure the builders make the cooties, the hearts for the monks right. I've got to make sure the cleaners come. There's so much work to be done. And I realized there was something very wrong with my lifestyle. And so I made a resolution. At least one morning a week, in the monastery where I live, I would not be the abbot. I'd pretend to be a visitor. I would actually imagine I was a visitor to the monastery in which I lived. So, that when people came up to me and said, oh, can I ask you a question on meditation? Sorry, not today, I'm not the visitor, I'm the visitor. Go and ask somebody else. Or well, the monk said, I want to disrobe and get married to a nun. So, well, I'm only a visitor, not my, not my problem. <laughs> or the, <laughs> I'm only exaggerating. Or the, the roof was leaking. No, oh, I'm only a visitor. When I visited the monastery where I live, then I could appreciate its peace and beauty. The home in which you live, the apartment, no matter what it is. When you go home, spend one couple of hours imagining you're a visitor in the house in which you live, not an owner. If you're a visitor, you don't have to wash the dishes. You don't have to clean up the garden. You don't have to put things away. You're a visitor. And then you can enjoy your home instead of your home being another workplace. So you try that, and then I can appreciate the beauty of a monastery. Once it was not mine. If you go into somebody else's house for dinner, do you wash up afterwards for them? When you go to a restaurant, a cafe, do you wash the dishes afterwards? Do you clean the table? Not your job. Because the restaurant is not yours. The other people's house is not mine. Therefore, you can enjoy it. When we own things, too many things, we have too much work. So spend time in the house which you live, thinking it's not mine. I'm just visiting for a couple of hours. And later on you can take on ownership and clean things up, but not all the time. It's the, the mind gets in the way. So, your body, your life, the Buddha's side of Victoria is not mine, it's ours. We don't take personal responsibility, joint responsibility. Planet Earth, is not mine, it's ours. We can enjoy its beauty and care for it at the same time. And as for, you know, it's just life and automatic destiny, of course it's not. We never know which way life is going to take us. Everything I ever planned in my life never works out. I never ever thought, when I became a monk, I became a monk to leave the world. To find a nice little place where I could sit and be meditate all day. And now look at me. Signing books, having my photograph taken, signing a book, <laughs> having a photograph taken. I never expected to do this. But you know that sometimes, when I first went to Australia, I realized that 
not far away from Perth, between Perth and Adelaide, in the Nullarbor Plain, there is underground caves. And there's plenty of water in there. And it shouldn't be that hard to arrange, you know, one of the roadhouses to drop, drop off some food every now and again. And I thought, I'm just going to run away into one of those caves and become a hermit. The hermit of the Nullarbor. And then I fantasized what, that, what would happen next. So as soon as I'd run away and become this hermit in the Nullarbor Caves, then sooner or later someone would find me. And then the word would get around and then 60 Minutes would do a documentary about me. <laughs> the hermit of the Nullarbor, because that's newsworthy. You know, how do you stay by yourself so long? How do you eat? And you are a theoretical physicist. Now why did you do that? And as soon as the word got around, then there'd be people with the tour buses, you know, they would actually, you know, on the sort of the, the highway, they'd make a detour. And of course, once they had the tour buses there, because there's nothing much to see over there, there'd be a tourist attraction once it gets known. And they'd have to have facilities for the tourists, you know, such as a little restaurant and a little um, toilets. And soon they'd be selling little um, uh, models of you. And when I say that, you know, just that's already happened. Over in Indonesia, they have these little clay models of a monk with glasses, fat, <laughs> doing a two-finger smile. It's already happening, merchandising. And have all these people coming up, taking photographs of the hermit of the Nullarbor. You can't escape. And the more you try and control your destiny, the more you find you don't relax. You're not loving life, you're trying to control life. Opening the door of your heart is not controlling, it's the opposite. If you have a partner in your life and you control her or him, the relationship is dead already. It can't last, control. But if you love them, share your life. And just discover where it's going to go. You don't know where it's going to go. Every time I don't make plans, things go wrong. I don't plan for the future and then there's trouble. Every time I do plan for the future, it goes wrong anyway. <laughs> Either way it goes wrong. So as a monk, I decide to enjoy my life, not making plans, before it goes wrong. <laughs> It's going to go wrong anyway, but it's more, more, <coughs> more shit for my apple tree. <laughs> so you're not afraid. You're not afraid of allowing life to just evolve. And you love it all the way, whether it's sickness or death. You love all of life. In the situation where a loved one passed, and we take it quite well, but other people around us doesn't. And they judge us for taking it well and not crying and not feeling sad. How should we deal with that situation? Okay, uh, then see if you can explain why you're not crying. Well, because I, like you say, it's Exactly. So what you're doing there, you're giving them another opportunity, an option. So sometimes life is about choices. If they see someone who is not crying at a funeral service, <coughs> or when things get disappointed, they look at you and say, how can you do that? And you can inspire people. You know, sometimes we just cry at a loss because that's what other people do. It's a socially um, developed response. And I say that because I was nine years in Northeast Thailand, which was an indigenous culture that West hadn't really got into that place yet. And in nine years, I never saw anybody cry at a funeral. They were respectful, and even some tragedies happened. <coughs> the wife, the husband, they did the cremation, and there was no tears. It was accepted as a part of life. And opposite to that, 
I was uh, doing a, a private retreat many years ago. When I come off retreat, everybody was really sad. I said, well, what's going on? Haven't you heard? Princess Diana has died. Well, now, did you know her? Was she a relation of yours, a loved one of yours? It was actually a culture of society grief. And it was something I'd never seen before. Everyone felt sad. Why? It was such a shame, such a loss. But what about the gain? Did that help anybody? I know that sometimes that <coughs> that people feel I'm cold. I'm not a very happy monk. I'm very warm and try and give as much as I possibly can. So there's another alternative to grief. But it's challenging for a person. There was, I gave a, a talk at a grief and loss conference once. <coughs> and at that conference, there was a mother of, in Perth, it's very well known, one of the Claremont serial killer victims. A young lady in Claremont, Bayview Terrace, had just disappeared. Her body was found later on. And she came up to me afterwards, and to nose to nose, she said something which really shocked me. How dare you, Ajahn Brahm, take away my grief? Her grief was who she was. And it gave her entry into many conferences. She was the mother of a victim who was very well known in the press. Sometimes we identify with the grief. You don't need to, there's another way. So I dare to take away other people's grief. You dare to be peaceful when somebody dies, even though you love them very much. The greatest act of love is to let someone go. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the non-human world, because you're talking specifically about grieving over a loved one or, or a princess die, um, or you know, any num number of people, but what about when you're looking at the planet and ecosystems, and I find it often people will kind of do a spiritual bypass and just to avoid the pain, say, of climate change or of the, you know, what's going on this planet. And if you work in the field of environment or anything, really, if you teach kids about, you know, environmental education or any of that stuff, I work in mental health and I see it if impacting people in very kind of indirect ways often through disasters and catastrophes like bushfires, floods and stuff. So how do you accept that, because that's what's going on, but yet not just accept the fact that we just have to sit back and, you know what I mean? This is human created, and so it's not just life you know, and death. I see it as something a bit different. Yeah, first of all, that crying doesn't really help, it wastes time. So the old saying, it's a Chinese proverb which I heard many, many years ago, rather light a candle than complain about darkness. Too many people complaining, crying, oh, what a shame it is, a terrible thing it is, what has happened? That gets you nowhere, that wastes time. Get out there and do something. Consume less. Have smaller houses, learn how to live with other people. Because it's one of the things that we live in huge houses these days. And there's maybe only one or two people in them. That creates a l this is just one simple thing. That creates just a lot of problems, you know, for the environment. The amount of, <coughs> the amount of materials has to go into a mansion in, Aus in, um, in Melbourne. And only one or two people live there. So much better live in a small house. Many, many people think outside the box. Solutions are there. And they are actually cost effective. But just the mindset needs to be encouraged. You're not measured by the size of your house. Look, I've made it, I've got a big mansion. 
I've got a big car. See if you can. Um, I remember this one guy, he said he travels in a Mercedes. It's a Mercedes bus every day, chauffeur driven. <laughs> so think like that. And then you can actually do a lot to help this planet. It's like the uh, simile of that uh, man in the in the uh, the boat. I can't stand this any longer. I'm leaving. We can't leave. The boat is planet Earth. There's no place we can go. We've got no choice. We have to fix up the engine. And I've got great hope that we will. Excellent. Hi, Ajahn. Um, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Um, I've got some friends of mine who are dying from cancer, but I would like to know what's the best way to care for the carer. Yeah, to care for the carer is again. <coughs> um, sometimes we can get too close to the person who's dying. We need to take time out as well. It's called respite. And sometimes a person who's dying of cancer says, hey, get out of here. You know, we want you to be happy and well as well. And you find that if you're caring just 24 7, that your care becomes, you become negative and resentful that you have to spend all this time caring for somebody. It's natural because, you know, you have a life as well. So the person who's dying of cancer and you who's caring for it, it has to be about us. Care for one another. It's not a one way. And people dying of cancer, ooh, are they dying of cancer? Because sometimes, you know, the death process is, is uncertain. I've seen too many people in my life, supposed to be dead years ago through cancer, and still alive. It's weird, cancer. Of all the diseases, it seems to be something which does be amenable to a good attitude. So much so, this oncologist, it was in um, Malaysia, she said she'd been, in, been an oncologist for such a long time that now when patients come into her rooms, she doesn't need to look at the biopsies or the scans. She can tell, as you said, 90% accuracy whether they're going to survive by their attitude. So that's an, such an important part. And even, you know, one of my best friends over in Perth, he was the, the head of the Cancer Support Association. You know, he's twice he's asked me because he knows the answer. It's like a Dorothy Dixon, the question which you know what the answer is going to be. He said, is it a good idea to fight cancer? I said, no. You don't fight the cancer. It's more stress. It's the fighting which caused the problem anyway. Stop doing battles. Stop using these military uh, synonyms that you can defeat the cancer. There's another way. This may sound strange, but you care for the cancer. You don't fight it. You care for it. That has far better prognosis. It's there to teach you something. Teaching you that your lifestyle was just really skewed. You care for your body, you care for life. And you care for yourself. And then that tends to ameliorate the cancer. Different ways of dealing with these things. The simile, the core simile which this is based on, is a teaching of the Buddha of the monster who came into the emperor's palace. Monster, while the emperor was away, the em <coughs> sorry, the empress was away, and a monster came into the emperor's, empress's palace, it was so scary, so violent, so horrid, that all of the security is supposed to, to stop such things coming into the palace, they froze. They hid under the tables, they went behind the flower pots, they hid in the cupboards. 
and that allowed this demon, this monster, to walk right through the palace into the throne room on the empress's throne. And that, that was just going too far. So the guard security said, get out of here now, you don't belong, get out of here now, you're in big trouble. And every angry word or angry thought or angry gesture, the monster grew an inch bigger, more ugly, more smelly, more violent. And by the time the empress came back, this monster was huge and was just so frightening and so smelly, the stench coming off this monster's skin was so bad that even the maggots crawling on its skin, they threw up, they vomited, they barfed. Even the maggots couldn't stand the smell. And when the empress came in, she knew straight away what to do. That's why she was elected to be the empress. She was the smartest. She looked at that monster and said, welcome. Thank you for coming to visit me. Why have you waited so long? Has anyone got you anything to drink yet? We got some tea, we got some orange juice, we got some peppermint tea. What would you like to drink? Get anything to eat yet? We can order a pizza for you because pizza comes in monster size. Monster pizza. And <coughs> she was sincerely kind. And every word of kindness, the monster shrank a little bit smaller. And then all of the security finally got the message and they started being kind to the monster. They gave the monster a foot massage, took about 20 of them around one foot. Have you ever had reflexology? It's just, just, just over there, ooh, ooh, that's so, so good. Somebody gave him a, a shoulder massage because that's such a big head. And they were so kind to this monster that every act of kindness, the monster shrank, got less smelly, less offensive, less violent, until it was soon back to the size it first came in, to the palace. They never stopped. They kept adding the kindness until one more act of kindness and the monster vanished completely away. And that's based on a story in the Samyutta Nikaya, one of the sutras of the Buddha. He called that an anger-eating monster, feeds on negativity. Get out of here, you don't belong. And it gets bigger and more of a problem. Many, not all, but many cancers are anger-eating monsters come into your palace, into your throne. Get out of here, you don't belong. That makes them worse. And I say that not lightly, because I've seen that happen too many times. Every year, I get in the last 28, 29 years, invited back to the Cancer Support Association, it's called Solaris Cancer Care now. And even the big opening a few years ago, five million or ten billion million dollar campus, paid for by the West Australian government, opened by the Premier and Ajahn Brahm. The two of us were the guests of honor to open it. So why me? I said because all those teachings you've given over those years, such as the angry eating monster, they work. It's a great accolade. So, there are many angry eating monsters in this world. Get out of here, you don't belong. And it makes it worse. Sorry, I went on a bit long there, but it's an important simile. So other que next question. Ajahn Brahm, thank you for coming to speak to us tonight. Uh, what I want to know is your views on euthanasia. Um, if someone was you love is dying and is in pain, isn't it kinder to actually assist them to...? So there's... Two types of euthanasia, and one is, you know, when you put someone out of your misery. You're not putting them out of their misery because you can't stand them suffering. So it's actually, that is killing somebody. That is not acceptable as a Buddhist. But the other one 
It's called voluntary assisted euthanasia. And that is where you, the person who's suffering, makes the free choice with no compulsion, in full control of their faculties, checked by psychologists, doctors, they have a terminal disease, and they wish to take the option of euthanasia, voluntary euthanasia. Voluntary is an important word there. They take responsibility for the end of their life. And as a Buddhist, we accept that. We are the owners of our karma. Yes, life is precious, but a life with such suffering becomes meaningless. And of course, in a position like mine, seeing many, many people, when I went to visit, what really turned me into supporting voluntary euthanasia as a choice was seeing a couple of people in the Dementia Ward who had such, <coughs> such severe dementia, they were literally just waking up every few seconds in fear. Because I travel around a lot, sometimes I stay in hotels and we hire us all over the place, people's houses, and sometimes I wake up in the morning and the first thing, where am I? Oh, I'm in the Buddhist style of Victoria today. Or I'm in Newby Buddhist Monastery tomorrow. Or I'm in, um, in Thailand to, the day after. I wake up and it takes me a few seconds to get my bearings. <coughs> and I know that can be very scary. Where am I? Who am I with? You've got nothing to relate to, to ground yourself. And I saw with two women, elderly women in this facility, they had terror in their eyes, 24-7. Something which no medicine, it wasn't physical pain, it was emotional trauma, not knowing where they are, what they're supposed to be doing, who they're with. <coughs> that was intolerable. So someone like that, if that's where you're going to end up, having the choice. <laughs> good person will still get a good rebirth as a Buddhist. If you have an old car, a very old car, which is just unroadworthy, wouldn't you send it to be recycled to the tip or somewhere and get a new one? Why would you push on in this old vehicle, which is intolerable? And you may not know that the first person in Australia to get legally assisted voluntary euthanasia was a Buddhist from the Northern Territory, Mr. Dent. I never met him, but one of my monks did. And he told that monk the reason why he took voluntary euthanasia was that he could endure you know, a life of pain, no quality, but his wife was his main carer. He loved his wife deeply, and he wanted to take voluntary euthanasia to free his wife, so she could have a life without always having to care for him. Of course, it's much more complex than that, but that was the main reason. And you couldn't, you couldn't question him. It was his decision. He made it out of compassion for his wife, not out of fear for himself. <laughs> so I think with the proper safeguards, there's no reason why not. Okay. So you know what euthanasia means? The you is, means a good, a good death. And if it really is a good death, maybe there's something to it. So it's a very strong argument, compassion. Okay, but it's, it's happened already in Victoria, it's happening in West Australia, it's happening throughout our world. It's an option, it's how to use that option, it's really the ethical point. Okay. Thank you so much, Ajahn. Okay.
Your presence and your words of wisdom have been so inspiring and a real gift tonight. 